here we are. Here we are. It's the end of unit five. It's the end of our unit videos for this entire course. That doesn't mean the learning stops, of course, but the required material for your exam does. Um, and this final video is all about the media, one of our favorite things to talk about. We're going to talk about this a lot after the exam ends, and we've been talking about it all year. So let's just dive into this. So when we think about the media, of course the media covers lots of different things, but we're talking about the media and how it relates to um, our political society. And where is the purpose when it comes to that? Now we've studied the First Amendment a lot, and we know that part of it is the freedom of the press. And the press has um, a very important role when it comes to our democracy and in relaying information to the people. Um, you know, there's a, it was a statement a few years ago when the Washington Post headline uh, became a democracy dies in darkness or something to that effect. And you see here from this example of a newspaper from the times of our revolution, how taking sides and being provocative in the press has really been nothing new. Regardless, um, the way the media does so has evolved. Um, it's evolved with technology because the media of today is very different than the media just 10 years ago, 50 years ago, and of course, um, from the time of our founding. And the media encompasses so many different things, right? Um, and we're going to look at it. Remember, it's just more than newspapers or channels, right? We have digital media that encompasses a lot of things um, that are on like, I'm sorry, they're on social media and things like that. We also have a subscription. So things you have to pay, you know, to to get like cable news channels that are on 24 seven, even uh, the uh, Comedy Central's Right, that's not a news network, but that has uh, that's political media. If you watch the Daily Show, we have um, broadcast, which is things like on the radio um, or ABC Seven in New York, where I worked for before these teaching days. Even movies, even com you know comedies like Borat um, are political movies. Then, of course, we have the old-fashioned print media, newspapers magazines. Yes, I know it would make someone's day when I put this month's cover of Time Magazine and also books like Stacey, Stacey Abrams' book, which is out right now. Keep in mind, there's some things that sort of fall um, in, in multi-layers of this. That could be things like podcasts or even um, satellite radio, right? Listening to Howard Stern, you're going to get political news. So don't just think as like the old stuffy anchor or uh, in a vest as, you know, where people get their news from. Your Snapchat has news features, right? Um, so now we think about accessibility. Not everyone has access to all these things. Uh, some of these require cell phones. Some of these require Wi-Fi or paying for cable or just purchasing newspapers. Um, most people still prefer to get their news from TV, about 41%. I think with time and maybe since this that was taken, that could have changed a little bit. Um, but remember, most voters are older and most, you know, most of uh, our older voters are not getting their news off TikTok, right? Um, so now let's look at different things it covers. Well, first we have the basic. We have news events. That's one of the ways that it shapes the uh, political knowledge of the people. And news events are just, you know, reporting on news events as it's happening. Um, their goal is to be objective, to just report the facts. Um, but as you see, like even here, there's the, some of them are more biased. Some try not to be biased. Um, errors can happen even when they're objective, right? So an example is um, they would cover things like uh, natural disasters is where I found like the AP, which is more of an objective source um, on fires or also protests. It's really hard for news agencies to cover protests objectively. Um, when you think of more objective news media, think more of your standard um, broadcast network stations, not so much the 24-7 news. So 
And that's not to say that they don't have biases either, but they are more objective. So um, Peter Jennings is no longer with us, but since I uh, mentioned ABC TV, I got to, you know, um, talk with him several times. So I had to share, um, you know, Mr. Jennings or the more famous one on the left. We have Walter Concrete from before our time, but sort of uh, is that that like status that a lot of people, a lot of news reporters aim to sort of emulate. All right. Now we have different types of journalism. So we also have investigative journalism. That's where um, there's a long running, you know, investigation into something. And, you know, there's really fa people win a lot of awards for this kind of investigative journalism. Uh, maybe they expose things on opioid abuse or um, certain things. So they, they, they're long running. They try to look at usually into something that's some sort of corruption. It requires financing to have this. It requires having access to lots of sources. Now, Geraldo today probably isn't taken so seriously in the news world. He's more of an entertainment biased end. But in his beginnings, he started as an investigative journalist and, you know, won a lot of uh, awards and received a lot of prestige for exposing things like um, mental health care centers not too far away from us right here. So something to look into if you're interested. All right. And these news uh, medias, our political knowledge is also shaped by how they cover elections. Now, this is election night coverage. But remember, with elections starting like 18 months beforehand, right, all of that helps shape who people are going to vote for, what they think about candidates, what they think about party platforms, or what their own opinions on the issues are. Um, so election coverage includes covering things like rallies, speeches, all those sorts of stuff. They will um, have polls. Um, it includes some of that horse race journalism where you're just so quick to try to get information out. Sometimes that leads to mistakes. And um, if you know of the famous election with Bush and Gore, lots of uh, news agencies said, oh, Gore's the winner. And then a few minutes later, like, oh, maybe not. Sorry, take that back. And now they're really careful to before they commit to an answer because of that. Um, but of course, election night is, is a big night. It's like the Super Bowl for political nerds and political coverage, covering debates, um, and all those sorts of things. Um, so right now, um, Trump, as we mentioned earlier, hasn't officially announced his candidacy, but just look at the way they cover different news media covers the Trump rallies, some with a more positive light, like the one from Fox News, and ones with a more negative uh, tone from such ones such as C CNBC. Okay, and now we also have political commentary. So these are often on news channels or news media, but it's a stretch to call it news because it's it's almost like an editorial, or it is an editorial. It's people's really not hiding biases. Um, that doesn't mean that no factual information is presented, but they make sure they attach their spin to it as well. And sometimes these can be helpful, and sometimes these can be dangerous, depending, you know, on on the response. So. On the right, you may have a Hannity uh, on Fox News or um, think of like a Rush Limbaugh, you know, on the radio. And on the left, you'll have uh, Rachel Maddow from MSNBC and others as well. Uh, keep in mind that this does not pertain to just, um, you know, cable news networks. This includes radio and includes blogs, social media coverage. Um, even just your old school editorial, right? So here is one from yesterday in the New York Times. And this was about um, uh, the spotlight into education uh, that we talked about in some classes and the politicalization of that or the fear of politicalization of education. Um, and this was uh, one of the pieces yesterday. So all this information um, influences the quality and the quantity of our political knowledge. With all this 24-7 media uh, and these all-day-long news cycles, we definitely have more quantity when it comes to political knowledge. But is the quality there? Um, and because of the changing media, you can say maybe in some ways it is, and maybe in some ways it isn't. And that's how um, we're going to end this uh, lovely course with looking at the changing media. One thing to keep in mind is the uh, the shrinking soundbite. Um, 
by this in the 1960s if a news station played a speech of a president it was probably several minutes now most sound bites are way under 10 seconds our attention spans have not been doing well and social media and the internet is only making that worse and what happens is sometimes you get little like twitter sized chunks of a speech and then you don't get the rest of the context so how is that going to change the quality of your political knowledge we also have clickbait media right just trying to get you down a rabbit hole also we have global accessibility um information that you share here could easily be shared around the world. There's political revolutions that attribute one of the reasons they were successful to Twitter, right? Things that, you know, our founding fathers did not have at times of our revolution. We also have the idea of pushing biased news or false news or fake news. So this was um, a, a viral thing that happened this week when Greg Kelly of Newsmax was talking about um, black conservatives, um, putting Ben Shapiro in there, who is not black, and also Herman Cain, who has since been deceased. So when we look at bias news, we always, you know, Newsmax is further to the right than a Fox News and not really looked at by the media industry as one with quality political news. Um, and what happens is if you suppose you're someone who follows Newsmax or or something on the other side of the spectrum, they, the, um, there's algorithms that picks up, oh, you like this, right? So they're gonna push more of similar type information in your feed. So that becomes part of that echo chamber we've talked about this year, this bubble, where you're gonna be constantly bombarded with information from one side and one point of view and not the other, or anything of the other is always gonna be looked at, down upon. So you know, how that is going to affect your political knowledge. Um, we also have polling data, right? And polling data um, with technology is able to come out more quickly. Um, and how does that impact campaigns, the knowledge that you get, how people do things. All right. And we also have a conglomerated um, media as well. And that is that lots of media sources are controlled or owned by the same agency. So we looked at years ago, people were upset when certain newspapers were being bought out by a, congl a conglomerate, a large company that owned lots of newspapers. So then how are you going to get a different perspective? Well, even now, some companies own several news channels, other types of channels, different types of media, right? So when you get it's sort of like a monopoly, if you will, but you have um, more controlled voices instead of uh, many more independent ones. You know, does this relate to factions? Not technically, but yes, in the broader spectrum of things. All right. So if these media agencies are going to put out information that's biased, it's really important and really crucial that we can identify that bias. And even if you know you prefer one news station one newspaper of, over the other, it's important that you're still aware of what biases you're being fed, right? So how do you decipher that, right? And there's a couple of things that help. First, is it current? Is it recent? Um, you'll, I can tell you how many times someone on, I know on Facebook uh, reposted a story and they get all worked up, but I'm like, you realize that's from two years ago and someone just retweets it and they don't even check the dates, right? So that's really important. The other thing is, is it relevant or is it useful, right? Why is this information being pushed out, right? There's always an agenda and you want to try to, you know, figure out what that is. Also, what about authority? Who is this from? Who is the author? Are they an expert on this? Um, are they known to have biases to begin with? right? Everyone thinks they're an expert these days. That doesn't mean that they are, right? Also accuracy. So we hear so much about fake news. I saw this from the AP just this morning, 524. So I screenshotted it uh, to use, um, you know, just because information is being pushed out there and you can find information from the other political parties and, and ideologies as well. But we all know that 
Trump and the fake news and the false news and the false election narrative is one that's been pushed out there a lot. Um, so accuracy helps if there's multiple sources. Um, a bunch of people can say the wrong thing, however, that does not make it right. Um, and that's all the stuff you need to keep in mind as well. And large, lastly, what is the purpose? Why is this information being put out there? Very similar to relevant or useful. Is it to inform you or is it to provoke emotion, right? Usually those commentators we spoke about, sometimes they're to inform, often they're to provoke emotion, right? If you want people to keep coming back to your station or buying your paper, your whatever, they know if they get an emotional hold on you, that sort of gives them an angle. Um, and that sells, it sells well, right? So always keep in mind, like, did they share this with me just to get mad, right? Or did they share this with me to inform me? Um, and if there's a goal, does that matter? Right. Um, it's also important to remember that there are intersections between the government and, um, our media. Now, there's extreme governments where you don't have the freedom of the press like we do. Uh, we learned about this, like in Russia this year, where they're like, no, you know, or um, you can only have the state media, not independent media, or certain countries um, not allowing access to social media. We do have some state-sponsored media. Um, like with radio, you get NPR. With TV, you get PBS and the Channel for Public Broadcasting as well. That's the old school PBS logo from when I was a kid. You might not remember that, but I was feeling nostalgic and had to share it. You also have um, the FCC, um, and they deal with things like bandwidths, monopolies, um, political information that gets out there. Um, but this stuff is all free, right? This is the stuff you're not paying for. I mean, you have to pay for a TV or a radio but you don't have to like pay a subscription for access to this. Um, and the FCC also monitors things that are out there. Um, for example, Slapgate uh, at the Oscars, lots of people complain to the FCC that, that it's violent TV, All right? Lastly, we have um, our, our intersection that tries to reach out to a more global media, um, like Voice of America and also Radio Free Europe. So like, people who are outside of our country, whether they're expats or um, people of other nations can sort of hear some of what's going on and how it relates to our American ideals. Um, and these are basically to support the ideas of freedom and to support democracy. And I thought this would be a really important way to tie in uh, our unit one and what we learned at the beginning of the year as we end. So, you know, one of my favorites is the apple of gold seg um, fragment from Lincoln, um, how the Constitution is made to preserve those ideals of democracy. And should those ideals of democracy be global in the first place? Well, Jefferson, who we know wrote, um, helped write some of our documents this year, like the Declaration, um, on the 50th anniversary, he wrote a letter. And they were asking like his words on what he thought as, you know, the, the declarations about 50 years old. And he writes this letter to Roger Whiteman and you can pause it or look it up and read the whole thing. But if you look midway through, it says, may it be to the world what I believe it will be. This is our declaration to some parts sooner to others later, but finally to all the signal of arousing men to burst their chains under which monkish ignorance and super superstition has persuaded them to bind themselves and to assume the blessings and security of self-government. The form which we have substituted restores the free right to the unbounded exercise of reason and freedom of opinion. All eyes are opened or opening to the rights of man. The general spread of the light of science has already laid upon to every view the palpable truth that the mass of mankind has not been born with saddles on their backs, nor a favored few booted and spurred ready to ride them legitimately by the grace of God. These are grounds of hope for others. For ourselves, let the annual return of this day forever refresh our recollections of these rights and an undiminished devotion to them. So when this year is done and this course is over, hopefully July 4th might be a little different for you. Think of these words and how Martin Luther King used these ideas in his letter of Birmingham jail. 
why these forms of media are important to upholding these ideals that we've learned about in our founding. All right, it's been a great year, guys. You got this.